One, two, three, four, five Coast Guard boots. Yes. If you've done all the legal available methods and they don't work, then the only thing that you have left is to put your body in the way. I feel a large amount of pride for what my dad does because save the world and all that. The odds are vanishingly small and you really are basically fucked. But that's no excuse for not figuring out what to do next, so. As you heard at the very beginning of the film, one of the intentions that Ken had in risking his liberty for climate was to assert the necessity defense. And um, this, in my 20 years of doing activist defense, I've only had a judge grant the necessity defense once in a forest defense case long, long ago. Uh, and so the judge in Skagit County for both trials denied um, the necessity defense. And so as you saw at the very closing credit, we have appealed uh, the outcome of that case based on the denial of the necessity defense alone, requesting that Washington Court of Appeals and then probably the Washington Supreme Court will rule on whether or not Ken should have been given the opportunity to present the defense of his choice to a jury of his peers. And one thing that I also wanted to comment that wasn't in the film is Ken uh, was convicted of the burglary charge and when we went for sentencing, uh, he was facing 10 years or more in prison. The corporation was seeking what was it, $210,000 in restitution for the of that chain that you saw. Um, and ultimately, the judge gave him 240 hours of community service, no probation, no fines, and no restitution at all. And so then next up was the North Dakota valve turners, which was Michael Foster and Sam Jessup. Sam was a film a videographer at the time. Michael was the valve turner. And uh, really, every one of these cases are in rural areas along the Canadian border where the pipeline crosses from Canada into the US. Most of the people there either earn a livelihood by working at a refinery or on a pipeline, or someone in their family does. Uh, you know, very often when we were picking jurors, we would be told that climate change was a hoax perpetuated by the Chinese. Um, and so these were not necessarily super friendly places to be doing this type of work. And I think uh, to Ken's credit and to the, the credit of this action, to get a hung jury in Skagit County, Washington, um, was pretty surprising to all of us. But having that corporation walk away with empty hands at the end of that sentencing was, uh, was really powerful because you know, the corporations can't control whether or not someone goes to jail or not, but they were certainly seeking to deter others and to really suppress the climate movement when they were seeking hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals that would literally bankrupt them you know, for the rest of their lives. And so oftentimes in these types of cases, it's the ask with regard to restitution where you really see the corporations and the state working together for this common goal of perpetuating the profits for the oil and gas industry. Um, in North Dakota, it was a really rough judge, rough jury. Uh, ultimately, both defendants were convicted and Michael Foster was sentenced to a year in, well, three years in prison with two years of it suspended. Um, and currently he is um, serving time in a North Dakota uh, state prison. 
And so please write to him. There's information on the internet so you can send him a book or um, write him a letter. Um, and in that case, again, uh, the corporations were seeking hundreds of thousands of dollars in restitution. Michael Foster ended up uh, being uh, held liable for $5,000 worth of restitution for just cutting that lock you know, against this multi-billion dollar corporation. Sam Jessup, who stood on the roadway and filmed uh, Michael Foster and whose guilty act in the conspiracy was driving the rental car from the airport to the location was actually found liable for $10,000 in restitution which makes absolutely no sense to me or anyone else, but that is the reality. And so in that case alone, both of those people, you know, that money has to be paid out of their own pocket and is part of the fundraising um, that we are all doing around the country. Uh, after that, we had Leonard uh, in Montana, in Choteau County, Montana, little tiny town, one room courthouse, um, and went through the full trial. The judge was pretty stoic in that case. Um, he was ultimately convicted, and uh, we had sentencing in that case, and were thrilled that after, after Michael was convicted to a year in prison, um, um, Leonard was also given a community service outcome and a little slap on the wrist in terms of some probation. And um, although in that case, again, the corporation sought hundreds of thousands of dollars in restitution, uh, we ended up getting, what was it? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, so about $3,700 in restitution in that case. And now um, the last of the cases uh, will be in Minnesota. Oh, and I should say in each of those other cases in North Dakota and in Montana, we have also filed appeals in those cases, um, challenging not only the denial of the necessity defense, but I especially in um, Michael's case, uh, some other trial legal matters that um, were going on as well. And so our final case left is in Minnesota with Emily Johnston and Annette Klapstein. And in that case, the trial judge granted us the necessity defense. And <laughs> which was the first time in, uh, you know, in any of these cases and certainly in, in the US where a climate activist was granted the necessity defense. Pretty soon after that, the state attorney appealed uh, the courts granting us of this defense. And so we've been waiting for months and months now for the, or for the Minnesota Court of Appeals to rule on whether or not we get to present the defense. And just a couple weeks ago, the Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled in our favor and we are trial bound now. So. No pressure, no pressure. Um, but we've also just heard that the state's attorney is now thinking about whether or not to appeal that decision up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, you know, they think that delay, delay, delay is on their side, but as you can tell just from the audience here, you know, the snowball is rolling downhill and only getting larger and stronger, and the longer they wait, you know, I think the more power uh, we will have and the case will have. Uh, we've got some of the top climate scientists and policy makers in the world that are going to be our experts in that trial. And the funds that we're raising tonight and with all of these film showings will go to pay travel costs and the out-of-pocket expenses, um, not only for CLDC, but we also always have to get local attorneys to help us in these states because we're not licensed there. And so we've been really privileged to have amazing local attorneys that come and join us in the courtroom. And every one of these trials, there's always a small cadre of people who show up and cook food and make sure that we have everything we need to be focused on the trial. And uh, we can't thank them enough for the support uh, and for the support of all the communities that have come out and have been part of these cases because 
I think you know it's not just a single person um, that will make this happen. You know, it's all of us together taking whatever risks and doing whatever we can. And so with that, I will pass the mic. So we have a couple of microphones if people have questions. And I think we'll just wander to you if you have a question. I have a question. <laughs> what, uh, what cities and towns are you going to go to? The question was, what, what towns and cities are, is your tour? <laughs> so um, I'm working hard to line up community screenings all over the country and actually the world. I have some requests coming in from Australia and New Zealand and the UK right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, at this point, uh, Ken and I are doing some Skype, Zoom Q&As, um, and we're coming to the more local um, screenings like this one. There's one tomorrow in Corvallis, and there's one in Hood River on the 15th. Um, it's possible that Ken will go on a tour, but that's a little bit unclear. But we're trying to encourage as many screenings as we can, and um, I personally am sort of cognizant that, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to be flying to Indiana and to Boston and to, to Texas when we could Skype in. This is a climate change film after all. <laughs> So it's a, it's a bit of a balance between trying to get it out as much as p possible. And these clipboards that are going around um, is to sign up to be on the newsletter to find out like when the DVD is available. But also there's a column if you are interested in hosting a community screening or you know even know of someone who might be, please um, check that and say where that screening might be. I, I have a question. How many people here were at um, Break Free? Yeah. Yeah. Eugene turns out. Um, Ken, you and I had dinner at the CLDC uh, event. You wouldn't remember, but you were telling me you were inspired in part by um, the Plowshares activists. Again, you wouldn't remember telling me that, but I think you did. And I, and I want to share this with you all. Um, on April 4th, a month ago, um, Martin Luther King's 50th anniversary of his assassination, in Kings Bay Naval Station in Georgia, seven people, most of them are my friends, uh, snuck onto the base. They are facing 11 years for a state felony and misdemeanor charges, and they're facing felony charges coming on Thursday. Um, but their, their thing was called Kings Bay Plowshares. There's a Facebook page. And I think they're pro they were protesting the militarism that we use to access the oil that, that you were protesting. There are certainly many, many connections. Maybe you would want to speak to that. Thanks. I do remember you, but I don't remember your name. Steve here. Steve, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, there are... Um, <clears throat> I, I, I did have a friend who was in one of the plowshares, the Pershing plowshares in Florida. Um, and the first person who I wrote to over two years that she was imprisoned. Um, and I think there's um, a number of parallels between doing climate action and action on uh, nuclear weapons. For one, it's the only other problem that's threat that's uh, civiliz potentially civilization busting. I mean, especially during the Cold War, War era, which is heating up again. Um, and for another, it's the kind of problem that seems so vast and so intractable that most people don't want to think about it. So in that way, they're very much linked. Ken, over on this side, my name's Matt. Um, first, uh, both you and Leonard, and, and filmmakers and uh, the attorneys, thank you all for what you've done. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, thank you for making me feel less crazy. Seriously, uh, I, I share your, your sense of overwhelm by the situation we're in. Uh, my question is really pretty straightforward. What are you doing next? I know you can't really tell us that. <laughs> what are you doing next and how can we help? Without joining the conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
this, this is where I'm supposed to go. Who in law enforcement? Who's here with law enforcement? It's out of curiosity. Um, well, first of all, we're, all of us are committed first through, you know, we have, still have a trial to go, and we have someone who's imprisoned for we don't know how long. So our first priority is supporting everyone through trial um, and imprisonment if that happens. And also to, as uh, Lauren mentioned, to raising money so that none of us, some of us are poor to begin with, aren't made even poorer by this, um, this action. Um, and then after that, we have Leonard and I are on a study committee. <laughs> Giving that some thought. We'll let, you know, we'll let you know when we figure it out. Um, okay, hi. Uh, I'm Avery McCray. I'm part of the lawsuit that's, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I also wanted to thank you guys because that's really awesome. Um, I was wondering, so in that video it showed um, you outside of Exxon um, standing there and when the cops came and they were asking, you know, saying like go to the sidewalk or get arrested, like what was going through your mind? Because like I would be like, oh, okay, okay, you know, but then I'd also be like, no, I'm, I'm going to stand here and I'd feel very conflicted. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I had, <clears throat> prior to the, um, the first, the mobile station there, I had been doing political work since I was 18, or even younger, actually. Um, I've known a lot of people who were involved in direct actions. I actually trained for a direct action with the Clamshell Alliance in New England, um, which is, and was part of an affinity group and was going to shut down the Seabrook power plant site which turned out to be the one that they opened the gates and invited us all in, and it was perfectly legal, so I wasn't arrested for that. So I had been doing political work for a long time, and then I, I, and even in the lobster boat, I actually wasn't ever arrested. So I was just uncertain. I was realized I was just full of fear about that whole process, middle-class kid and all, and just never had dealt with this. So what the, the genesis of the mobile station was, I decided I needed to practice. <laughs> so I practiced. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that was a, um, I was full of fear in there. I mean, I, I was getting fearful watching it again. I mean, I just had, I'm not used to being on that, you know, dealing with uh, law enforcement in that way. Um, it is the case that the minute that those handcuffs went on, I felt an immense sense of relief, which I'm told is not uncommon. It's kind of once you're past, like, what can you do at that point? <laughs> Before that, it makes sense to be scared because you still could run away potentially, but after that. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's what came to mind. Hey, Debbie, I've got a question over here. Okay, go for it. This is actually not a question, but... Um, may I sing you a song? Sure. Is it short? Sure. Be good to your mommy. You came from her tummy. She washed your smelly bummy. So be good to your mommy. Because he filled your tummy with everything yummy. Yummy mommy. Be good to your Mommy. Right. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have a have a question. No, I do try my best. My mom refused to be uh, interviewed for this movie. <laughs> 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 not that because she's not supportive, but um, I don't even know why she didn't. Hi. You first, Lauren. Sorry. I was just going to mention, uh, in the film, they showed um, Submedia's website where they were teaching people how to shut down pipelines. And it reminded me that uh, this upcoming Saturday at 7 p.m., CLDC is hosting Franklin Lopez and Submedia here at the U of O. Uh, they have a new <coughs> road show that they're doing. So if you are a Submedia follower, uh, Saturday, 7 p.m. at the U of O, and Charles can tell you the room number if you want to check it out. 
Hi, um, I also organize and I'm really interested in your process of how you found people to work with and who you chose and why, because um, that part is really hard. Is that a question for me? Any Leonard was part, Leonard and I were the first two of the shut it down uh, crowd, so, um, uh, uh, and it's, it's different, very, very different and the court is uh, to shut it down uh, because of the needs of um, secrecy on the one hand, and the court was wide open um, and shut it down. We were in a somewhat fumbling way try, <laughs> trying to be secure. Um, and the stakes were clearly higher, um, as we see with Michael. We, we actually had no way of knowing, um, and nor did Lauren really, know what was likely to happen because nobody had ever quite done this before. There are federal laws uh, with stiff penalties and we ended up kind of fumblingly to looking at the uh, experience of Tim to Christopher for no particular reason, just saying, well, let's assume it'll be a bit more than a year. Like nobody should do this if they're not prepared to end up in that same circumstances that Tim ended up facing. Um, so that tends to reduce your numbers a little, right there. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe Leonard has it. We, it. it was a process, that we, we had a core group of people that we knew in, you know, in our area, right? We have Seattle, Portland, Eugene. Uh, we kind of have a set of people that we can talk to. It'd be a lot easier to imagine, envision doing an action like shut it down here, or perhaps in New England, a lot harder if you were doing it uh, based in other parts of the country. Um, and it was a process of, um, there were a number of people who considered taking a variety of roles at different levels of risk. Sometimes those people just opted to higher levels, sometimes they backed away. Um, and But it was all done fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. I mean, we, the idea came up in, right after uh, Anacortes, it was early June. Uh, we were initially trying to do this in August, partly because we wanted to, or some of us, have widely different political perspectives and strategic minds, so people were doing it for different reasons. I was one of the people that wanted to do it in a way um, that would uh, potentially impact the presidential election. So I was wanting to do it on the day that Trump was in Seattle or Everett, and um, we missed that. But we came pretty, it was pretty, pretty good time. And, and we had uh, three basic criteria as we were looking for people to participate with us. Um, one, like Ken says, that they really truly understood the possible consequences and were good with that, willing to go forward. Um, second, that um, they would be willing to stay um, after the action and wait for arrest and go on to trial as, as part of it. And third, um, folks that were thoroughly committed to nonviolence. And, and for me, and I think several others of us, it wasn't just nonviolence, but I guess what I would call prayerful or uh, sacred nonviolence, a, a, a deep respect for the sacredness of life. In retrospect, we ended up with people who have a good sense of humor, but I would add that as a <laughs> going forward. <laughs> I have a question about the legal process you're going through. I'm going to really show my ignorance. The appeals that you have, if they are granted, does that mean you go back to trial again? And could the outcome be worse than what happened? So a victory at the appellate level is the chance at another trial, this time able to put on the full necessity defense. And um, the way that most state court appellate processes work is if the person is ultimately found guilty again, they can do no worse than when they, what they were sentenced to the first time. So we've got some low, low stakes here, but. Well, yeah, except that I, I could still be charged with sabotage because I was hung jury twice, correct me if I'm wrong, right? So if we go back to trial, in the worst case, I would be facing both charges again, and the penalty couldn't be worse than burglary, but I could be convicted of sabotage, so there is 
some potential. I was kind of bummed that I wasn't convicted of sabotage because it's such a cool crime. <laughs> yeah, Oregon used to have a sabotage statute, and Washington's used to actually be called anarchism and sabotage, right? So that was the precursor to it. So Ken was really excited about being labeled a saboteur, not only a felon, but a saboteur as well. But Yeah, the, when Lindsay, what, Lindsay and Carl, the videographers following me, were initially charged with the same set of charges that I was charged with. We, was four, we had four charges against us, um, and um, including sabotage. But one of them was assemblage of saboteurs which was way far the best charge that anybody got. <laughs> so when we'd sit around and have coffee, I had the, well, we had the bragging rights originally. It was great. Uh, during this lull, I just want to do a shout out for Lauren and Cooper and CLDC. Um, <laughs> And, and I have to tell you that I went to my sentencing hearing on March 20th fully prepared to go to jail. I, I brought my driver's license, some money to put into a jail account, and a health insurance card. Um, I didn't expect to, to leave that courthouse and be free. And I also had restitution of almost $30,000 hanging over my head. and. Um, that I would not be sitting here today and would not be looking at the mild, uh, comparatively mild amount of restitution if Lauren had not been in the courtroom. Um, you would have had to have been there. She was amazing. Yeah, I have, a, I have a comment and a question. But first, uh, I want to say thank you all for your courage. Thank you. And it's an honor. It's an honor to meet you. And, and since you're going to Corvallis tomorrow, is that right? You, you, you might want to pass by another gas station. Uh, maybe not to protest. I, I'm working with, um, there's, a, there's an off, a chapter of our Children's Trust in Corvallis. It's called You Can. And I, I'm working with my son, who's a muralist, and we're actually painting a mural on the topic of climate change and the crisis behind a Shell gas station. <laughs> it's, it's on the back side of the gas station. It's on 4th and Jefferson, just a block from Claim right. 52, block, 50, block 51, that really great brewery with really good beer. Claim 50. Lin Lindsay just said that sounds Instagram worthy. Yeah, so anyway, it's not we'll done. It's, we've only been do, working one weekend. Every weekend in, in May, we'll be working there till it's done. So, but the, there's a, it's a small group of about 10 to 15 high school students and middle school students that are getting organized. And, and, um, but you know what they're telling me? They're, kind of, they're saying, okay, everybody in Corvallis, they're aware of climate change, but their life is good and they just don't get involved. So these kids, these kids, they got the fire. They're, they're, they don't know what to say to their fellow students. So anyway, if you have any comment about that, people that they're aware, they're informed, they're educated, but they're still, you know, what, what do you say? Leonard well, looks like he's chomping at the bit to answer that one. I have an answer too, but let's have him go first. Um, only because I lived for over 30 years in Corvallis. And, and I agree um, that we don't have near the level of response there as in many places to the crisis that we're facing. I have to tell you, though, um, there's a, an active 350 chapter. They don't measure up to 350 Eugene. But uh, there's some people that are, are working very diligently. And uh, so I, wanna, uh, I would give them a shout out as well. Um, I, I would say that there's some significant uh, strategic misthinking that has guided the major climate work um, for 20 years and, and more if you want to date it back to 1970. And one of the key parts of that is that 
that somehow we're going to address climate change by simply getting a majority opinion to support change. That's not how change happens. It's especially not how change happens on long-term issues where there's an immense amount of ungodly amount of power and wealth and so forth on the other side and where most people have no incentive to do anything. Change in those circumstances comes from rel relatively small numbers of really motivated and willing to take risk people who are then supported by a larger other numbers. So um, I felt like, and, and I in fact spent a large part of my professional life engaged in working on how do we, you know, how do we figure out, how do we build majority support for these things, and that was just wrong-headed. Um, we've in fact been, uh, if you count yourself part of the progressive movement, which I don't really, but I'll call it anyway, um, we've just been, you know, routed in national elections by people that didn't give a shit about majority uh, in that sense. I mean, what they focused on was um, finding their core and making sure that those people were motivated to work really hard. And we haven't done that. That's what we need to do on climate. So I care less about majority. I don't worry about that at all. I worry about what's the what's our core and how um, how willing to take risk and other things is our core. You know, you all. So it just seems like it's getting better. And one thing I'll uh, add to that is every summer for the last five summers, the CLDC has put on the uh, climate Next Generation Climate Justice Action Camp for 14 to 18 year old kids, where we teach them how to build a campaign and do media and know your rights. And this summer, it's gonna be down in Southern Oregon and the uh, target is the LNG Jordan Cove pipeline. <laughs> And we're, we're doing that camp in conjunction with Rogue Climate down in Southern Oregon. Over half the youth that come are youth of color, uh, many of them from reservations and have never been outside the reservation. And we not only teach them the skills on how to be better organizers than we were at that age, but they also learn how to work with each other across class divides and racial divides and gender identity divides, you know, skills that we all uh, could probably use to improve ourselves as adults. And, you know, they were ready to go. They were coming to adult action camps anyway. So we decided to give them their own action camp in a safer, more constructive environment. And um, if you want to sponsor a camper, talk to us at the back. Um, we, no one is turned away for lack of funds, so most of the kids that come uh, don't pay anything, and we literally drive vans around California and Oregon picking up the kids and bringing them to the camp. So, uh, and if you want more information on that, um, you can talk to us in the back. Um. Back in the day when they were drawing up that big document uh, called the Constitution, um, James Madison said when asked, why, what are you doing? He said, we're doing this um, to protect um, the minority of the opulent uh, against the majority. Uh, it seems like we've got majority opinion on a lot of things, gun control, I think climate change, a lot of stuff, but because when you peel back the uh, wrapping and you see um, the corporation and their hegemony over any kind of real democracy, uh, that that's, you know, that's, that's the problem. And all the others emanate from that. And they followed their original intent, it sounds like, to the letter, it seems like that's what's happening. Um, I would say yes and no. Um, <clears throat> yes, the um, you know sheer volume, the scale of the power we're facing is immense. Um, I personally, I, I, so I agree with that. I personally haven't thought for a while that we were likely to win early in this, that, that we were only likely, that, that really what we're doing is creating um, a viable alternative for 
for the point when things begin to really fall apart. I just happen to think that was hundreds of years away, but it's actually now likely to be within you know, my lifetime, certainly my son's lifetime, um, because that's what's going to have, you know, and, and it may well be too late at that point. I mean, we're talking about relatively short periods of time here, but we, as we, as climate impacts begin to, you know, um, um, unwrap the, the, the normal course of how things work, then we'll be faced with really dramatic alternatives. The, the worst case of autocratic corporate control and geoengineering and so forth, or something else. And that's, I think that's what we're aiming for. I disagree um, that we have anywhere close to a majority, or, uh, or as I said earlier, majority doesn't so much matter. If you look at, and I've been tracking this now for um, over 10 years, if you look at open-ended polling questions in America where you go to someone and say some version of, what do you think is the most important problem facing the nation, the incoming president, Congress, however it's phrased, the world, these questions are asked regularly. Not a polling question, like here's five problems, rank them, but just what do you think is the most important problem? Now, if a pollster were to ask me that, I would say climate change, and I would have said climate change for about the last eight years. The percentage of Americans who are answering that question has never been above 2% margin of error. Never, even now. So, we don't have, I mean, um, we're up, we often quote uh, uh, Chenoweth, uh, uh, you know, his work that looked that actually calculates what are the numbers of people that led to significant political change around the country, usually taking down dictators or something along those lines. And she has, a, uh, you know, after looking at a lot of data sets, came up with some actual numbers. It's about three and a half percent. If you have three and a half percent of a given population that is engaged in, you know high level action with majority support behind them, they win. Well, we don't have the three and a half of yet. We don't even have 2% yet. We don't even know what we have. So that's our, I think that's our central problem. Not that we're facing rich people. We're always facing fucking rich people. Excuse my language. I mean, you know, the thing that distinguishes, uh, you know, and the, the difference is that is what's on, on the line here is so much more. We don't have the, luxury of saying we'll be standing on the shoulders of the people who have come before us and you know on and on we don't have that time um, so that's where I go back to the first which is we're kind of in a situation where we're going to have to deal in crisis in the midst of collapse that's when we'll have to act and we need more people than we have now I just wanted to tell everyone that um, I just found out this afternoon, actually, that we're going to have another showing here in Eugene on Wednesday, June 13th at the Bijou Theater. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. <coughs> so um, if you have friends who you would think would like to see the movie, Fret Family, just please spread the word. And um, if you liked what you saw and you're a social media user, you could even write a little review and spread it around. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, but they will have it on their website, so it's uh, June 13th. It's a Wednesday. I actually don't have a hashtag. Uh, I have a website, thereluctantradicalmovie.com. Maybe we should make a hashtag. Oh. And while we're talking about that kind of thing, um, you can go to our website as well. It's shutitdown.today, not .com or .org. It's shutitdown.today. I had a question. Um, I joined the Green Party several years ago to try to move this situation forward, and I was dismayed by the members of the Green Party the lack of um, interest in the Green Party in Eugene, of all places. I was really quite shocked by the just lack of passion on this matter. And so I do think we need more people. It won't be just the fringe that can move this case forward. And what dismays me 
is that there's the Green Party and Greenpeace and the Sierra Club and your group and the other group and the Green, these guys and those guys. And it seems like we're so disparate all over the place, all fragmented all over. Can we unify around one boycott? I grew up in California when we didn't eat grapes for like 20 years. I mean, it worked. Mm -hmm. They got their message through very loudly and our whole town, we, nobody ate grapes. I would like to see similar massive movement in boycott action. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, to I totally agree. I mean, I think this, this is actually the thing I've spent my, most of my time on is this question of why it is that, that the institution and organizations we built for precisely this moment don't seem to be actually doing the things that we built them to create, right? Um, and, the, and a foremost example of that is, here we are at this very late date, there is no climate coalition of major U.S. environmental organizations that's speaking with one voice or even attempting to come up with a coherent st strategy that we could all follow. I totally agree. Um, I think it's a very clear example that, you know, partly what we're facing here is, and I, in my own version of what Leonard was saying earlier, is that there's kind of a need to do this work with great deal of compassion for individuals, including individuals who are on the other side of this, but with a clear understanding that our institutions are evil, including our own ones. Like, literally, that we're in this problem because we've got corporations that are only, that exist outside of anyone's thought for the only purpose of making more money um, with lots of greedy people in them. Yes, let's not ignore that. Um, but our own organizations are also in the same way, primarily about maintaining their own organizational needs and structures and so forth. And so I, I don't know, I started out a long, I, I ended up doing direct action because other things that I was trying to do didn't work. The first thing I thought we should do is take over our own organizations. And I was surprised when people would go, oh, well, we can't do that. And I'm like, well, how can we, if we can't take over our own organizations and institution, how do we expect to deal with Shell and Mobile? I mean, I I'm still of that opinion. Yeah. So that'll be one of the things that we're working on, like coming up with um, a means to try to hold our institutions accountable and to press them to come up with. I don't know that boycott necessarily is the right thing, but any, you know, a coherent thing that we could all do, yeah. So the discussion's getting interesting, but we're going to try to keep some kind of order. I think Karen's next. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you all for being part of that wonderful, inspiring film and the actions behind it. I have a question for Lindsay, though. What, what it, will your next film be? I don't know the answer to what my next film will be, but I'm actually working on an audio documentary about the Minnesota trial um, where Emily and, and Annette will be tried um, and able to use the necessity defense. So I'm interested to try a podcast. I've never done it before, and it's a, a heck of a lot cheaper. So. <laughs> okay. I, I, I lived in south, southeastern Massachusetts, and I just moved out here, and... Um, I, I, I met Sam Sutter uh, when he was running for um, National Congressional Representative of uh, Southeastern uh, Congressional District. And um, shortly after that, um, I read about the coal barge, and then I heard that he dropped the charges, and that made, made headlines. And I guess, you know, he, he's, he seems like a really admirable um, politician. But um, since that happened, um, he, he ran for, he was mayor, I believe, of New Bedford, and then he lost, he lost re-election somewhere down the line. And so his political career seemed to kind of come to an end, hopefully not. He's, he's a dynamic person. And, you know, we have this guy Keating, William Keating, the representative there, and he's conservative as, as all can be. So I guess uh, it's kind of discouraging when you have a really good person like that. And, uh, you know, you hope maybe they will have a political life, you know. That's it. Just, it's kind of a statement, you know. Uh, but it's a question, actually. 
We're actually hoping to give Sam a, another round of, of good things he can do uh, by being, becoming a speaker uh, and to do outreach in the uh, prosecutorial police circles. So um, we're, we're trying to, we're hoping we'll bring him out to the PILT conference to speak next year. That'd be great. So we have one final question and then we'll have uh, a little bit of time you can interact with these folks individually. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your part, and I want to particularly note with Lindsay, the human element of your film is really powerful. It's personal, it's historical, and it brought a lot of emotion to the surface of such a logical thing to do, in a way. Um, and I think that one of the things that we can all do, that we talk about a lot in 350 Eugene, is to be a part of the conversation. We all need to say climate change as often and as emphatically as we can in every situation to bring us all out because it is radical and it is time and reluctant or not, we're here. So thank you so much.